So let's think about Augustine of Hippo on anthropology and soteriology. The first point of departure is to think about what Augustine means about both human nature and original sin. Now, he argues that in Scripture, it's clear both that humans were originally created good, God creates humanity and says, this is very good, and, continuing on in the creation narrative, that the sin of Adam results in the sin for all. And Augustine has that reading based on his use of Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5, verse 12. And so this is what Augustine writes in On Nature and Grace, which is a response to Pelagius. This is um, chapter 3, section 3. He writes, The whole mass, that would be humanity, destined for damnation, became the property of the destroyer. No one then, no one at all, has been set free or will be set free except by the grace of the Redeemer. He goes on to clarify a little bit later in chapter 5 of On Nature and Grace that humans aren't condemned in their nature. We don't have a bad human nature, but we have a defect that is expressed in original sin, and Christ heals the defect. So note something here, that both Pelagius and Augustine both agree that human nature is originally created good, the question is, what kind of effect has the first sin of Adam had on human nature? And they both also argue for the importance of the grace of Christ. The question is, how does the grace of Christ cooperate with the human will? Now let's focus a little bit more on original sin here. So, original sin is not something you have done. Original sin for humanity is is contracted, not committed. So original sin is not your personal fault or any human being's personal fault, but the deprivation from human nature of original holiness and justice because of Adam's first sin. And Adam's sin isn't simply the eating of the fruits, but rather it is the act of pride or the sin of pride and the sin of deviating from God's will. The movement of the human self away from God's will and curving in upon itself. This is actually a phrase Augustine uses a lot to talk about sin. The curvature of the human will upon itself to become essentially self-centered. That's sin. Deviating from God's will and putting your will first. That is the sin of pride. It's a sin of rebellion. And then restoration is found in the work of Christ. As uh, Augustine writes in On Nature and Grace, chapter 4, section 4. So then original sin is a core doctrine for Augustine. And he sees this, and here I'm going to be referencing to another treatise Augustine wrote called, surprisingly enough, On Original Sin. He follows, his, he follows how the Apostle Paul writes about um, the two Adams. The first Adam of Genesis 1, and Jesus Christ as the second Adam. And these two ideals are two types of humanity. These are essential for understanding Paul's, uh, Augustine's theology. So, I have a quote here from On Original Sin by Augustine. Quote, Whoever maintains that in any age at all, human nature has no need of the second Adam, that is Jesus Christ, because it was not damaged in the first Adam, is proven to be an enemy of the grace of God. Not on some question about which one can doubt or be in error without harm to faith, but on the very rule of faith that makes us Christian. Christ becomes incarnate in order to deal with our sin. If we say that humans could, in some capacity, choose the good, choose fully to will what God's will is, then there would be no need for the incarnation 
And then that would seem to deny the New Testament witness about the necessity of Christ coming to dwell with us. And so then let's think about what it is that Christ offers us. And Augustine would define that as grace. And so Augustine states that the law would teach us that there's a problem with human nature, that we're commanded to follow God's laws, and yet we constantly find ourselves unable to do this. And here again, Augustine is following Paul's reasoning, the letters of the Romans, especially chapter 4, verse 15, and chapter 7, uh, seven verse 7. And so Augustine agrees with Paul and would say that then righteousness comes apart from the law as a gift from God. This is an on the grace of Christ. And then God assists humans to will and do the good that they can't do alone through Christ's righteousness. Christ's righteousness is applied to us as believers in Christ. And it's God's grace through Christ that assists us to will the good. A lot of this comes from Augustine's own experience and his struggle with sin that if you read the Confessions by Augustine of Hippo, you would find where he identifies his own powerlessness against sin. So if he agrees with Pelagius that sin is an addiction, he says, well, we can't break this addiction. We need Christ alone. And unlike Pelagius, we would say there'd be a cooperation between our will and Christ's grace. Augustine's experience is it's grace alone. My will is so broken that it couldn't ever will this good, except by the grace of Christ. So this helps us think about what salvation would mean to Augustine. And here his sociology is both legal and therapeutic, unlike uh, Pelagius' legal and juridical. Now, because Augustine has a very pessimistic anthropology, he says humans can't save themselves, then there are two steps to salvation for Augustine. So first, we have a wounded nature that needs to be healed before we can obey. And we cannot heal ourselves. So then second, as we're healed by the grace of Christ, we are then released from our sinful state. So salvation is intrinsic to us. Our nature is being healed. And extrinsic, God is choosing then, based on how our nature has been healed, whether to reward or to punish. So here's a quote from On Nature and Grace that illustrates this. For those who are healthy do not need a physician, but are those who are ill. Here, uh, he's citing the Gospel of Luke. However, this human nature in which we are all born from Adam now requires a physician because it's not healthy. Consequently, that criminal or sinful nature draws upon itself the most righteous punishment. So, if we have not had our nature healed by Christ, we will be punished. But because he has a pessimistic anthropology, he insists on the working of grace. So again, from On Nature and Grace, quote, Consequently, the whole human mass ought to be punished. This is why those who are liberated from it, from sin, by grace, are not called vessels of their own merits, but quoting Romans 9, vessels of mercy. So, the salvation comes from outside of us and we experience this grace. And so there's, again, a practical outcome for this anthropology. And here it is that baptism is indeed for original sin. And all are in need of it, including children. So he writes, quote, from his treatise on original sin. The church baptizes little ones for the forgiveness of sins, not sins they commit through imitation on account of the example of the first sinner. So we don't baptize infants because they're acting in imitation of a sin their parents did or an imitation of Adam, the first sinner, but rather we baptize them 
for sins which they contracted through birth on account of the defect at the origin. In some ways, children have no have not inherently chosen sin, but their nature has become flawed already at birth because of the way in which sin simply affects all of human nature. There's something that's transmitted and contracted, not first imitated. And this would then lead us to the question of election and predestination, which is a constant debate throughout Christianity, especially in the Western traditions. So Augustine would argue that all humans deserve to be condemned because of the fall or the first sin of Adam and also because of their own sins. And so God chooses who receives the grace of faith in Christ without considering their works. And again, for Augustine, this is autobiographical. He knew in himself he could not choose God. He knew in himself he was powerless to sin, and so his own conversion to Christ he experiences as coming externally from God through Christ to him. This, of course, raises the problem of double predestination. Now, Augusta never teaches double predestination, which is that God will thus predestine some for righteousness and then predestine others for condemnation. Augustine wants to hold off on that piece, and yet that remains implicit in his theology and then gets worked out in later theologians. So it's worth, in the last bit of this video, just to note how this controversy resolves. The Pelagian controversy is resolved at uh, the Council of Carthage, where 200 bishops in the year 418, under the leadership of Augustine, produce nine canons, church laws, that condemn Pelagius and his teachings, that summarize Catholic doctrine on original sin, uh, the nature of grace, and the, uh, the universality of human sinfulness. From this, Pope Zosimus responds from Rome. He condemns Pelagianism in his own writing to the universal church. And then Pelagius is further condemned at the Council of Ephesus in 431. He has gone from to Constantinople at this point to seek refuge, and he's banished, and then sort of disappears from the history books. And so what emerges is that all of the church condemns Pelagius' teachings, and in the West in particular, the Augustinian positions on original sin, the necessity of grace, and uh, the need to acknowledge all human sinfulness, our inability to save ourselves, really becomes core Christian doctrine. However, we find that this debate keeps on emerging. So, for example, the Council of Orange in um, southern uh, Gaul, what's now France, in year 529, once again has to affirm the doctrines of original sin, talks about the necessity of the grace of Christ to be converted, and the need for uh, to receive charity from the Holy Spirit, that is the impulse to love the good and act for the good. And the Council of Orange also then condemns double predestination. So what you're going to find in the Western Catholic Church is both an affirmation of original sin and a denial of double predestination. And you find this throughout the teachings of the uh, Church, especially of Rome. So, for example, in the 9th century, there's a theologian named Gottschalk, who proposes double predestination as a church teaching and is condemned. The Council of Trent, which is the response of the Roman Catholic Church to Protestantism, condemns Calvin's double predestination. In the 17th and 18th century, double predestination, though, emerges in Roman Catholic circles in France through a movement called the Jansenists. So we see, again, double predestination as a constant idea that Roman Catholicism has to bat down as inadmissible. And of course, also in the 18th century is when we really see double predestination flourishing in Puritan thought. So 
this debate about how to deal with original sin, how to think about election, how to think about grace, how to think about the human will, and what it can and can't do, remains with us. And so one of the things I've done is posted on Popular, the course learning site, a summary of both the 39 articles of the Church of England from the 16th century and excerpts from the Catechism of the 1979 Book of Common Prayer of the Episcopal Church. I wanted to look at those and see how these various categories are taught and reflect on what the position of the Episcopal Church is today. So we'll be doing some of that in classwork as well. All right, that is all for Nature and Grace through Augustine and Pelagius. And for our final video for this week, we will be talking about the Donatist controversy.